What is up, my friends? Welcome to the Father Daughter Dance Podcast, where we help dads keep up with the velocity of how things are changing for our daughters and create space for daughters and kids to come on to the podcast and talk about the relationship. Uh, please subscribe to, rate, and review the pod. It really, really helps. Uh, I'm delighted to let you know that my pod is currently in the top 5% of about 3 million worldwide podcasts, according to some Nielsen right, type review agency. And the best part is that uh, people tend to listen to the whole thing. And so thank you to my listeners. You are the best. And I don't just say that because you're listening to my podcast. Anyways, uh, John Spencer joins the, the pod all the way from the UK. John was a high school classmate. Um, I was in some advanced math courses with him and he was advanced compared to me. I was a remedial um, advanced math person. But uh, he was just a great dude in, um, in high school. And he joins the pod to talk about his wonderful daughter, Katya, who is 18, and also some groundbreaking research that he did uh, that his team recently published. John talks about bearing witness to and supporting Katya through a really big move when she was 10 from the U.S. to the U.K., and it was interesting. He described, I hadn't really thought about this. He described the move about how they talked about it, about how it was impacting everyone, even though the move was, was right for a lot of ways, everybody was impacted. And, and, and that created a sort of familial connection space to talk about difficult and rewarding um, parts of that experience. And, you know, there's a lot more to it as we talked about a number of other things, but I thought that was really fascinating and, and we then talked about his research, um, which explored the question of how poverty and nourishment um, impacts the brain of young children from six months to 18 months, and also what, what was called stunting, it's stunting growth. And uh, I'm interested in learning as much as I can um, about different parental situations and how it impacts the children. And, you know, going into a part of India that uh, has... Poverty and undernourishment is, is just a whole world I'm not even familiar with. And they did it in a, in a part of India that, was, that, that is comparatively more poor and under, under-resourced, if you will. The impact on the kids' development is noticeable based on the data, and, and, and we talk about it in more depth. But I can't help but put that learning into a couple of contexts because the, the, the data shows some, some, some adverse, um, if that's a proper word, impact on it. And it just made me immediately think there are millions of kids right now in the U.S. who are living in poverty and are um, undernourished. And it just puts the kids behind in so many different ways. And, you know, when I see data like this, it's like, or, or looking into a world like this, it's like, I just wonder, like my heart, it gets into my heart and I have like more compassion and desire for understanding, like I want to learn more. And it's a reality for me to see that, um, you know, kids that I see maybe acting out for a variety of ways, I don't even necessarily know. It's like I'm in the bus and a kid is, is misbehaving. And um, it's just like, suddenly, what does that really mean? And where does it come from? And I mean, I'll admit that when I see that data and then look at, consider people who are well off with kids who are well off and kids who um, are plenty nourished, um, whether they have some of these same cognitive issues, it's, I don't know, does that make, I, I get a little, um, I'm less open about it, I guess. It's, it's just, does that mean I'm less compassionate? I don't even know. But it's like when I see this, it's just like, look, it's right there. And what I do know is it seems like poverty um, just begets poverty in most cases, just seems to be that way. And I just always sort of known that, but didn't really think of like really identifiable contributing factors that uh, John and his team have studied to make a at least partially seemingly causal relationship of an outcome that uh, is more likely going to end up with someone staying in that cycle. He tells a lovely story about the kids, even though they're having these challenges playing with one another that I'd, I'd really love you to hear. And 
it just also occurs to me like this is like a high leverage opportunity and leverage meaning what needs to go in and what do we get out? And it's just like these, some of the things they talked about, which he calls intervention. And no, I'm not talking about the reality show, even though I watch a million of them and I cry every time, um, like about two thirds of the way through the show or maybe three quarters. And particularly the very end when they, sh they play that song is meant to evoke emotions. It evokes emotions. But anyway, I digress. Interventions talk about things they can do to help out. It's like, it's just like things, there are things that could be done almost at scale without massive investment. Um, and I do love that John finds this stuff hopeful now that he sees it because there's like ways to address it. And I just feel a little sad and overwhelmed by it. It's just immediately I start thinking about the number of kids that are out there that are in these situations. And it just, it feels like a Mount Everest to me. And I'm certainly happy that uh, we have guys like John who are out there scaling the mountain with an oxygen mask. And, you know, my daughter is in grad school to be a teacher. And she'll have an impact on these kids. And th they'll likely be second to fifth graders and is in a town where Davis, which, where um, kids are likely to have resources. But I don't know, maybe her attitude of service, because let's face it, teaching at that level is th there's an element of service to it for sure, even though it's tremendously rewarding. But it's just like, maybe that will help bring an attitude of service to these kids that will then be a part of solving these kind of things, because it's one of the reasons I have massive belief in our younger generation because they have the ability to get the view of that broader perspective that I'm talking about, about seeing some of the difficulty and suffering around the world. And they also have a proclivity to do something about it, which is awesome. And maybe when I peel back some of what he sort of briefly mentioned as political and economic challenges to actually implement it, which feel overwhelming. It's, it's like, that's part of the, the, the challenges John has to scale that mountain with his team. And John's not the only person, obviously. I can just remember there's a whole new set of climbers that are ready to start to go after the mountain. That's that younger generation. I don't know. To me, that feels hopeful. You know what? I'll take it. I'll take that. You know what else I'll take? I'll take a cup of you joining me. A cuppa. I don't know why. A couple of you joining me. My friends, won't you join me on the dance floor? Step into the father-daughter dance podcast, UK style. Let's do this. What is up, my friends? Welcome. Yeah, it's a new episode of the father-daughter dance podcast. And I'm keeping our guest up. What would I, what I guess would be late? At least to me, it would be late. But my, my good friend, John Spencer, is calling in from uh, England. John, how are you today? Doing great. How about you? Yeah. Good. Wait, what time is it? Just so I know. Uh, 5.30 right now. So 5.30. Okay. So I got, yeah. a good another hour. I got a good another hour and a half being up at that point. I go to bed <laughs> super early. What time do you go to yeah. bed? Just like you're, you're, you're um, I'm a night owl. I usually go to bed around, yeah, around 11.30 or something like that. Wait, what happens between like 8 and 11.30? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. So usually do a little TV watching. Okay. And then got to do house chores, you know? Wow. We, like to leave the, we like to leave the kitchen spotless when we go to bed. All right. And then uh, cool. read for a little bit and then go to bed. Oh, okay. All right. That sounds, that sounds good. I don't do any of that. My kitchen is not spotless before I go to bed typically. But uh, this... This is a father-daughter dance podcast first, by the way, John. I have never worn a tank top in any one of my interviews. <laughs> right. And so I think maybe like I just started, like my producer just started making videos of this stuff. So I think maybe this is my way to kind of encourage people to, uh, to check out the video because now they're going to hear on audio that uh, I've got a tank top on. But um, oh, that'll, that'll draw them in. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I, I uh, so John and I, um, have known each other since uh, high school. And John and I were in some, what, wasn't it, weren't we in like advanced pre-calc together? Is that, is that right? Or what, awesome. John's way yeah. smarter than I am. Yeah. <laughs> John was always smarter than I am. And it's like advanced pre-calc or something like that. And then it was just like, then, and then you just raced ahead of me and because you went into advanced <laughs> stuff that I could never get. I was never good for it. But, uh, 
You know, I mean, the thing is, is in, in, in like honors pre-calc, you need someone to bend the curve to that, to the one side of being like really bad. And that was me. There you so, go. There you go. No, but I, I'm, I'm thrilled to, <laughs> yeah, it was really fun, really fun to be there with you. Um, so I'm really glad you're here, John. Uh, why don't we start by just talking a little bit about um, you, where you're, we've talked a bit about it, where you're from, uh, children, et cetera. So uh, let's see, as you said, I live in the UK in a, a town called Norwich, which is on uh, the, the eastern edge of the country, kind of directly across from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, it's a great city uh, and a fine city, which is the slogan of Norwich. Uh, <laughs> a fine city? Yeah, a fine city, <laughs> which I love that. I love that too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we moved here in 2015. Um, moved over with my wife and two kids. So my wife is Larissa. Uh, we're both professors at the University of East Anglia. Uh, and then I've got a daughter, Katya, and a son, Alec. Alec is 20, Katya is 18. Wait, the University of what? University of East Anglia. Like A-N-G-L-I-A? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It's, I mean, honestly, that's a town that it sounds like a part of the brain. <laughs> Actually, the first time I saw it, I thought it was a, an island in the Car Caribbean, you know, East Anguilla. That's <laughs> even better. Yeah. That's even better. But um, it's, uh, it's actually refers to the eastern uh, coastal region of England. Okay. It, it is nice that you, it is interesting to me that you uh, are geographically oriented by being across from Amsterdam. I'm just going to note that. That's just a yeah. note. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, so I know uh, you're a professor of what? Professor of psychology. Psychology. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's possible that during this during this conversation, you you say, "Well, why did you why did you ask that, Tim? What's your relationship with <laughs> I would like, say I'm not that kind of psychologist. <laughs> okay, you're not that kind of psychologist. Got it? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, hey, can we talk a little bit about your upbringing, like um, your parents and what they valued and and such? Sure. Let's see. So I was, I'm uh, the youngest of five kids. My brothers and sisters are all about a year or so apart. And I'm five years removed from the, my closest sibling. So by the time we, we met, which was in high school, um, my siblings were all out of the house when I was kind of an only child. Oh, right. Okay. <clears throat> Got it. Um, which was you know, pretty different from how my, my siblings uh, were raised. Um, and also at that point, my parents were in a different time in their lives. So they, my dad was at, uh, worked at Notre Dame. He was uh, the assistant provost for computing at that point. He had retired from the military. Uh, so when we moved to South Bend, that was, he, he had retired a, a couple of years before we moved. Um, Notre Dame was really his, uh, one of the, the first um, real jobs outside of the military that he had. Mm -hmm. So it led to a lot of transformation for my parents in terms of their lives. And they were really oriented toward the Catholic Church at that point. And um, so kind of a different different period for them. And, and that had an impact on how they raised me. Your four siblings, uh, boys, girls, what? what? Um, so it goes two older, older sisters and then two, two brothers, two brothers. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, so when you say they were sisters, nine years older than me. Okay. And got then it. My, um, my youngest brother is five years older than me. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now I got it. Um, when you say they were oriented towards the Catholic church, how did that impact you sort of, or how, how did it? what impact did that have on you as a younger child, like, or, or even a high schooler? Like, how did your parents speak to you? Like, how did you know you were loved? That kind of stuff. You know, you know, at that time, so my mom was doing, um, she was pretty invested in the, in the church and had started to get into like, um, divinity classes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so they were pretty active in the, in the parish we, we were involved in. And of course, it impacted me by sending me to a Catholic school in St. Joe. Yeah, and I would say during my high school period, yeah, I was pretty, 
pretty uh, in, into the Catholic Church and religion and things like that for a while. Um, it didn't necessarily mean I uh, lived my my life as a saintly devout person, but um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it definitely there there was that element in our lives, I would say. And in Did terms of get... go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just saying, in terms of my parents, I think they were they were pretty communicative at that point, and you know, I, I definitely felt loved. And they they communicated that openly. To me, which again was pretty different from the way the context in which my my uh, siblings were raised, because we were a pretty strict military family when I was much younger. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So your father's move to become the assistant provost of computing, which, by the way, at that time was probably pretty cutting edge. Um, yeah. Like, did you ever talk to them about that transition from being in a stricter military home into being what? you experienced or talk to your brothers or yeah. about it? Yeah, definitely some. I mean, they, I think they were, it was a pretty conscious decision for them that they wanted to kind of raise me differently. And, hmm. you know, I, I think it was a good synergy to, you know, I, I did well in school and things like that. Yes. So they, they could trust me and give me more leeway than they necessarily give my siblings. And I generally returned that trust. You said you moved to England in 2015? Yep. Which means your daughter would have been 10, right? Yeah. Daughter 10, son 12. And what did you do in the U.S. before you moved to England? Um, I was a professor at the University of Iowa. Okay. So can, let's touch on that a little bit. Um, so were you doing the same thing, professor of psychology? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So... When you moved from the U.S. to England, um, your daughter's in a, in my experience, at least with my one daughter, my experience was a 10 is like this really tender age where a lot of things are changing and the way you communicate changes and all that yeah. stuff. Like, did the move, how did the move change things, if at all, from like living in a U.S. context to suddenly living in a U.K. context? Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine from... A kid's perspective, it's radically different, right? So, um, yeah, my, let's see, my daughter came in, you know, the schooling system is completely different too. So she came in um, at year six, which is the last year of primary school. Um, whereas, let's see, she left when we were, she would have been in fifth grade, mm -hmm. right? And so... The transition for her was really challenging because, you know, one, if you, I mean, if you know anything about how, how girls uh, interact, you know, imagine coming into a classroom setting, the, the kids in the class have all been in school together for, you know, six, seven years, right? And you're now the, this American girl who shows up. Um, in the last year of primary school, when they're all to have friends, friendship groups established there. And so it was really hard for her to break into um, friend groups, especially with girls. And so she was a bit of a tomboy. And so she ended up hanging out with the guys. Okay. Um, so she ended up playing uh, football, which was soccer, right? <laughs> and she, she, uh, started playing goal, goalkeeper and was playing on the boys team and basically made friends with, with uh, some of the boys in, in the class and made, had, had some, you know, friends, friendship, friendships with, with the girls, but I would say it was much harder to break in on the, on the, on the girlfriend. And did she have a lot of friends who were girls before she left the U S she did. Yeah. Yeah. She had some kind of a couple couple of girls and they were kind of a core group of friends together and everything when she was in Iowa City. Got it. So did it ask more or something different of you as her dad to talk about that? Because it sounds, I know girls who came into Zoe's school and um, they were, uh, you know, fourth or fifth grade. It's difficult. 
it's difficult. Yeah. And um, I'm guessing Katya had a lot of feelings about it. And like, do you feel that you had to grow differently as her dad? Um, kind of, although different, but the same circumstance of the difference, the way your parents were when the military style to the new style. But I'm not saying that's the, yeah. that's the analogy. I'm just saying, or did you know going into it, it's like, we are going to have to do with this. And so I need to prep. And maybe you did that for six months and whatever. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? We didn't know exactly what the challenges would be, but we knew it would be challenging. So we were mm -hmm. ready to kind of meet those challenges and just take it step by step as a family. And that's what we did. And I mean, certainly made us really close as a, as a family, right? Because we were mm -hmm. all going through this cultural change together. And, you know, definitely wasn't easy for any of us. And so that, you know, it was a real bonding experience for all of us. And I think we were committed to being there for each other from the get go. Oh, that's interesting. So did you share with her some of the difficulties you were having? Um, yeah, some, sometimes like we would talk about how just like they had to make new friends, we had to make new friends mm -hmm. and how difficult that was as adults, right? Right. And when you're, when you're a kid, you come into, a, you know, the classroom setting, you, maybe you're playing sports. And so you've got another route to meet people. But as an adult, we realized, huh, <laughs> we know. We don't have a classroom. We don't have sports, you know. So how do right. how do we meet people? And of course, you uh -huh. know, we we met people through work, and that was that was good. Um, we also met people through the kids, which was also another way to to meet other parents and things like that. But it was, right. yeah, it was hard, right? Because you go from you've got your you've got your friends as an adult before you move, and now you dumped into this new culture, and yeah, it's like ah. Damn, I gotta make I gotta make friends again. <laughs> I forgot about that. Did you? <laughs> How do I make friends? Yeah. Um, um. Did you? Did you and Larissa make the move to England? Like, what was the primary driver behind you, or driver or two of you making that decision? To because it sounds like you were doing what you wanted to do in Iowa, but then this new opportunity came up. Yeah. So it was it was a good opportunity professionally. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say that probably the bigger deal. Um, so, you know, I had been at Iowa since 1997 and Larissa joined the faculty, I think in 2001. Mm -hmm. So being in, we'd been in Iowa for, for a while and in particular, so Larissa grew up in Muncie, Indiana, mm -hmm. and then she went to IU for both undergrad and her PhD. And then we moved to Iowa and I think, you know, having spent her entire life in I States, she was ready for a, a new challenge. <laughs> and the idea of moving to a, a cool city in England was exciting. And yeah, so we decided it was good professionally and time for a change personally as well. Wow. I never considered the idea that uh, living in an I state may feed the ego. <laughs> never occurred to me until you just said that yeah. um do you find with katya that like how do you and i'm just so curious about this transition and it's so interesting to hear i've got so many questions about that she that she because she was someone who was gifted athletically because playing keeper and football or soccer or whatever uh, for a boys team, that's a lot of responsibility yeah. and you got to be like an assertive person. Like, like goalies are assertive usually, but, um, let's start there first, actually. So, um, you know, given that, um, given that that's the dynamic, like there's one thing, like when someone says tomboy, I don't exactly know what it means. I usually associate it with them being gifted athletically in some way, or maybe just get along better with the guys or whatever it is like, but do you, does it resonate when I say you have to be assertive and like it's a risky position to play as keeper or anything like that? Does any of that resonate? It, it does a bit. I mean, uh, it's interesting because so, so Katja is now at uni and um, interestingly, so in, in high school, she, she took up basketball and started playing basketball. Oh, okay. And she mm -hmm. was, her plan was to 
play basketball when she got to uni. And it turned out that the place she goes, which is the University of Sussex, has a pretty competitive girls basketball team. And so they didn't take any freshmen on the team. And so she wanted to be involved in a sports team as a good way to meet people and socialize and things like mm -hmm. that. So she decided to, to try out for football and now she's playing goalkeeper again. So it's, it's funny to have this <laughs> conversation, so right? That, and yes. think back to 10 year old Katya playing goalkeeper on the boys team. And then she left it for a while and now she's back to it, but on the girls team. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. But yeah, she's got a, I mean, she's definitely, um, she's definitely a pretty tough kid. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. She's got definitely an inner strength, which maybe comes out on the pitch a bit. How did you and, or how did, or how do you and Larissa team up to support her? Or, or like, 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 is there certain areas where you're stronger than Larissa and Larissa is strong? Or, or is it just both like, is, is it collaborative? Or like, talk about that. Yeah, I'd say it's pretty collaborative. I mean, there are, um, there are some things that it's just easier to talk to mom about. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I'm happy to, have, you know, kind of give Katya and Larissa the space to have their own relationship, you know? And yep. we, we definitely are very collaborative in terms of parenting and trying to each offer our own perspectives and be supportive in our own unique ways and things like that. Did you find that because Katya sort of uh, socially integrated with... Uh, the boys when she came over there was it was it a difficult or easy transition for her to actually then now because i'm guessing now she has particularly now that she's in college they're all starting from i don't know if they call them freshmen by the way those listening he says uni he doesn't mean uniform he means <laughs> university, university just so we all know that's right what was the transition like for her from like going from a, a group of male friends um, when she previously had a group of core girlfriends or female friends to now probably having relationships with, uh, with, with young women. Now I'm, I'm, I'm guessing like, like this is going to bias the question. I know that. Um, Cause I'm guessing like that experience actually opened her to be able to relate to more people um, of different types, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is she, when she got to then uh, the equivalent of high school, right or secondary school, um, then she started to gravitate more back to, you know, uh, female relationships. Oh, got it. Formed okay. a core group of, you know, uh, female friends. And as you know, because we were both teenage boys, teenage boys can be rather difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it's been interesting. So she, she really did go from, Closer relationship with boys, you know, when she first moved here and then transitioned mm -hmm. to closer relationship with girls as boys became more problematic. <laughs> <laughs> problematic slash, well, I, I'm not sure what her um, sexual orientation is. We don't have to talk about that, but it's like interesting to some folks who, uh, who prefer um, boys. Yeah. Problematic and interesting, yeah, which exactly. seems to go kind of hand in hand yeah. at times. Let's face it. Exactly. <laughs> Let's just face it. Exactly. <laughs> um, and what would she, you know, what, what would she say she value? What would you say if I had her here? And by the way, just so she knows, and you know, she's welcome to come on this podcast as a guest. I love having the daughter of the dad. I, I just love that experience. Um, what would she say she values most about you? Well, Tim, funny you should ask. Well. Because <laughs> I, I asked her, of course. Oh, that's very sweet. Yeah. So she said, what did I say? Okay, question one, right? What do you value most about your dad? She said, your funniness and how easy it is to talk to you about stuff. How I don't think you're judging me when we do talk, uh, that you take time for us to hang out and play sports and you're oh. patient. Oh my God. Yeah. I was like, rock that on. Is so, oh my gosh, that is gold star stuff. Yeah. And just so you know, um, John wasn't asking that question out of just pure inspiration. I gave him the questions yeah. beforehand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think a great opportunity to have. It's like, I don't know how Katya would answer this. So let's ask. Oh my gosh. Like, 
You're the first person that's ever done that oh, yeah? on this podcast. I've been doing it for th- yeah for three seasons. No one has ever that. That's just oh, yeah. It's, it's is that great. is that your like is that like your curiosity or is that your like I understand I don't know or I like there's just like so much at play that you would <laughs> take the time to actually say, you know what I mean? It's like like if you looked at yourself like yeah, what what would you say drove that other than I don't know what she would say? Yeah, no, I thought that. Yeah, it's a great question. I'm, and I, rather than um, make assumptions about it, I felt like, yeah, she she might actually enjoy answering that question. Oh, you know? that's so, so yeah. good. Well, she's, she's definitely someone who could be on this podcast. I'm just <laughs> telling you that right now. Um, uh, well, then let's take question number two, which I'm guessing you sent her as well. Yeah, I did. Um, uh, which she says, if I were to ask Larissa, what would she say that you, John, need to most improve on or need to improve on. Right. So she said, in terms of what I need to improve on, and this almost brought a tear to my eye, of course. She said, I have no idea how to answer that because I think you're an amazing father who doesn't need to improve. Wow. And I said, oh, that's pretty awesome to hear. And she said, just the truth. And I said, thanks. You're pretty amazing yourself. Mutual admiration. Oh, my God. (laughs) That is super sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really thanks for asking sweet. me those questions. Because no, you're welcome. <laughs> it was a great moment to reach out to my daughter on that level. How did that like? When you sent the second one, is there any part of you that was like nervous about what she might say, or or just more like here, like what, like bef- as you sent it and you hadn't gotten a response, <laughs> like what, what what did you have feelings about it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was I, I was honestly just really interested to hear what she would say. And if there were things that she felt like I needed to improve on, then yeah, I would uh, embrace that and kind of take it to heart. So it was kind of a good mm-hmm. opportunity to say, yeah, I've never really asked. So why not take the chance to, to see what she would say? Well, that is so interesting because um, it just reminds me that like devoted dads, to our daughters or sons for that matter. It's like, I don't know that we need like an annual performance evaluation, <laughs> but, but, the, but you know what the truth is, John, I've never asked my daughter that. Yeah. Like the closest we've come is we've been sharing, we, we've written each other letters on our birthdays for like, God, I guess 15 or 18 years now. Um, and so we write about how we feel about one another, but we don't real. it's usually the first question, not the second question. Um, well, let me ask you, then let me ask you, that's her perspective. Right. What's your perspective on the second question? Like you look at yourself right. and you say, hmm, I, I would benefit and so would she if I grew here. Like, is there a place where you see yourself wanting to be even better? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, I... Um... One of the things that is really, I think, critical about parenting is the dynamic nature of parenting, you know, because your kids are always changing and you're always changing. Right. You got to kind of, kind of keep up and be willing to, uh, yeah, be willing to change over time. And I guess Mm -hmm. one thing that, you know, if I'm reflecting on what I could do better, I guess, you know, I, I want to make sure as my daughter, who's now becoming an adult, which is kind of crazy to, to realize, to make sure that I keep changing with her, you know, because as she's starting to go through new things and she's now gone off on her own, um, that might mean the relationship has to change slightly. And I need to make sure kind of I'm, I'm open minded to that as well. So then I change with her, you know? So, yeah, that's really interesting because um, I always look at it as like a weightlifting analogy, which is you start with the lower weights and it's like, and you build from there. Um, But form is important. You know what I mean? So it's like, (laughs) you you know, I would talk to my daughter about things when she was eight or 10, 10 is better probably because for me, I was um, in my dark years for some of those years. Um, But it's just like, oh, she's, she's now 23. 
And I can no longer just say, oh, when I was in high school, I was this. It's just like, oh, she's 23 and she's a woman and she is embarking upon a career. She's going to, she's a teacher. She's gonna, she wants to be a teacher as well. Um, it's like, what am I like? So like, I look back on me, it's like, I made some bad career decisions and it's like, how do I talk to her about her career and her, her, um, you know, what she nourishes, what she feeds and, and that, and, and let her right. um, make mistakes as well. And so, um, you know, it's just, it, you just reminded me that, you know, it, it, parenting an 18 year old is different than parenting a 10 year old, which is sort of a platitude, but it's like, you recognize that, um, wait, do you feel, do, do you feel equipped today to parent a 23 year old? Or is it more like when the time comes, I think I will be I, like, I will be equipped. I'll be ready to change. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, it's interesting going through this transition to university, being a professor myself, right? So now, you know, I sit down with my advisees who are all freshmen oh, and it's like, right. you are like, you are my daughter. I got to make sure I'm a good advisor to you. <laughs> right. right. I'm not going to just blow you off because like the shit you're going through is real and it's hard. Um, and so I think that um, as she gets older, you know, I, I can't guarantee I'll be ready, but I got to know that things are going to change. I mean, each year in at university, then when she goes out and gets a job, I mean, these are all dramatic changes in life. And that will necessitate that the relationship has to change in some ways. At least. Right. You have to be ready for that and open to that. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself being overly psychological with her or psychology based with her? Um. No, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny because she took, uh, took psychology as one of her A-levels, like one of the subjects she focused in on the last two years of high school. Okay. And uh -huh. so she knows a lot of the psychology lingo, so sometimes we'll joke about that. <laughs> like, she, uh, I can't remember what she just whipped out the other day, but some psychological term, and it, it was just hilarious. Yeah, that's a great place to connect. Um, yeah. And it actually is like, it, it's, go ahead. Yeah, you know, more just, to say about that? No, I was just going to say she's throwing jargon my way, which I guess <laughs> is like a scientific way of throwing shade, right? <laughs> yeah, but you're like a ninja. I, you know, whatever. <laughs> she, she's ready, man. She's, she's, she's taking the thing on. It's like that, that, that fight scene from Matrix. Um, right. She's ready for the big deal. Uh, you got to know it. Um, it's actually a great place to... To, we'll probably bring bring her up again, but it's like it's a place to, to sort of pivot a little bit because um, so John and I are Facebook friends and we we exchange messages or comments whatever and and I um, recently noticed he put up a, uh, a link to a research a piece of research he he had done which I found fascinating um, and uh, I would love to talk with you about it so why don't we start by um, you giving sort of an executive summary in words that anybody can understand sure. of um, what the, maybe what the question was and what the research is. Yeah, so the, the research is about um, early development of cognition or thinking. And we were um, interested in how uh, poverty and undernutrition impact how the infants learn to think about the world around them. Okay. Right. Uh, and so we did a piece of work in uh, India, uh, in a town called Shivgar, India, which is in the uh, province of Uttar Pradesh, which is in the, nor the northern part of the country. Um, so, so, for example, Delhi's in Uttar Pradesh. Okay. And we uh, collaborated with a fantastic group of uh, researchers over in India. Uh, they're, they're in a place called the Community Empowerment Lab, fantastic mm -hmm. organization. And basically what we wanted to do was go in. Um, they had a, they've been working in a rural area of uh, this place called Shivgar for about 15 to 20 years now. And they've got a really good relationship with the community. 
Um, and it allowed us to then basically come in and assess infants as young as six months of age. And then mm-hmm. again, when they were eight, uh, one year later, when they were 18 months. And mm-hmm. what our question was is, um, you know, kids who are experiencing uh, extreme forms of poverty uh, and undernutrition, which leads to short growth for their age, um, does that have an impact on cognition? Let me make sure I understand the question. And then let's, and let's for the moment, yeah. maybe define, I, I think the word that you used for it was stunt, right? Is yeah, stunting. Stunt? Yeah. Stunting. Okay. Yeah. Stunting is the, is the, is the thing where they don't, they're shorter, basically. Yeah, short, short for age, and it's a basically common um, cause is undernutrition. So they're okay. not, you know, not uh, consuming enough energy and calories. So they're mm-hmm. short for their age, and we call them stunted infants. Okay, so so stunt has, doesn't have to do with their emotional or or thinking part. It's just physical. Just physical, yeah. And then the question okay, is, okay. does that have an impact on on thinking? Right. Okay. Does the undernutrition and the, uh, what was the, oh, the poverty yeah. uh, have the, which results in a stunting. Does it also impact their thinking? Is that the correct way, correct yeah. way to say it? Or is yeah. it the thinking? Yeah. Okay. Got yeah. it. Got Cause it. The, the interesting thing is when you are experiencing uh, undernutrition, the body mm-hmm. actually, part of what happens is the, the body devotes energy and resources to the brain to try to spare the brain is the idea. And as a consequence, the body is short for, for age. Got it. And so the, okay. que- the question then is interesting. You know, we know it's having an effect on the physical body. Is it also having an effect on the brain, which way back thing? Okay, got it. So when you say us, just so I know, who is the us? It's you and who else? Yeah, so this is my research group at the University of East Anglia and then folks at the Community okay. Empowerment Lab in India. Okay, is Larissa involved in this as well, or just you? Uh, this was just the uh, she, she was involved in parts of that. We we in addition to assessing uh, what I'll talk about in a minute, which is uh, an aspect of cognition that has to do with the the visual mm-hmm. world and how infants represent the visual yep. world around them. Uh, we also assessed some aspects of language, and she was involved in some of that. Okay, well, let's go to that then. Let's go to the uh, let's go to the visual piece yeah. first let's because yeah. uh, you say affects cognition just so everybody knows cognition means tell us what cognition Cognition means. just means thinking and then the okay, type of it. thinking we're looking at is something called visual working memory okay so um the term working memory basically refers to how people actively keep information in mind for short periods of time mm-hmm. like say up to 20 seconds mm-hmm. So we're talking about kind of a type of short-term memory for visual information. So visual working memory. Okay. Okay. Got it. And okay. visual working memory is something we use about 10,000 times a day. So every mm-hmm. time we, uh, let's say, look over here and then look to the other side and then look back, visual working memory is engaged to detect changes in the world when they occur. Ah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So that, you know, changes could be, you know, keeping you from getting hit by that car that's hurtling down the road. It could be, you know, you, where's my coffee cup? It could be, where's my iPhone? Whatever. Right. Just sort of monitoring the visual world around you. Okay. So we were interested in this form of thinking uh, because we can assess it as early as six months of age. Uh, and we and it it it's a, a type of cognition that we think is kind of a foundational type of cognition, uh, and then it it is involved in later things like learning words, uh, and it's involved in that because when infants learn words, they have to represent objects and attach words to those objects, right? So the visual part of word learning is important. And then we also think it's important later for things like something called executive function, which is kids' ability to control their own behaviors and sort of reflect on their behaviors mm-hmm. and things like that. 
and working memory is a kind of key part of that process as well, because you have to Got it. you have to kind of keep track of your, the world around you in order to know how to behave. So your research showed that uh, in conditions with um, poverty and uh, undernutrition, that is impacted how? Like, yeah, to, to maybe bring yeah. it back to stunt. Yeah. Like, how does it? So, so basically, stunted infants um, had, were, had poor working memory abilities and instead were more distractible. Ah. So Got the it. kind of flip side of working memory is distraction. You have a hard time kind of actively maintaining information about the world around you. And so you sort of flip from, from this to this to this without really keeping track of what's going on. We found that stunted infants had poor working memory abilities. And a big part of the paper was we showed that at the level of, of brain activity. Okay, let me make sure I'm following this. Yeah. Fast. I find this stuff fascinating, um, not just like in an intellectual sense, because I just immediately go to, I immediately go to that you don't need to do this kind of stuff just in that environment because there's like, but you did control things because I, have, you ever, have you heard of this, uh, the book, The Body Keeps the Score? Ah. Uh, so it's by Bessel van der Kirk. It's, this, it's about trauma. Um, but the trauma they looked at was in people who were primarily um, like in like uh, in war or yeah. in um, sexually abusive, like really awful things. And um, but I read it was a very important piece of work for me to, about my body. But I read it and then started applying it to less severe circumstances. And I understood it. That's why I find this so interesting, because I think what I hear you saying is that because they don't have good executive memory, you called it, their body, their brain is using up a bunch of energy to then refigure everything out every time they're looking around. Is that a way to say it? Like you say distracting or yeah. distracted? Is that, is that a way to say it? Yeah, I mean, basically, if the uh, what, what's interesting is the, um, so holding things in working memory is a yeah. pretty energy consuming process. Oh, okay. And so it kind of makes some sense that these kids who are stunted have difficulty entering into that energy consuming process. Okay. Because right? they have fewer energy resources. And right. the consequence of that is they're very distractible, right? Um, and then that, of course, developmentally is going to have cascading effects because if you're distractible as an infant, you're having a harder time maintaining what's around you. It's going to be harder to learn things about the world around you. Um, yeah. So, and that's actually another thing we found in the paper was that when we looked at cognition or thinking one year later, those stunted kids were behind the curve, basically. That's so interesting. I would think it'd be the other way around, but you're saying working memory actually takes a lot of energy. And what, what you're saying is that in circumstances of undernourishment and poverty, they don't have the energy to devote to create a good working memory yeah. or a functional working memory. Yeah. Which then has consequences for learning down the, down the road. Was there anything given to whether or not the mother and father were, were present or is it just like literally just like the conditions had to be? The, the interesting thing is it seems to me like poverty and undernourished kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Is there a difference? You know what I mean? Like, um, there, there. I mean, some some kids who were uh, from families with few resources were not stunted, for example. So we could kind of tease that apart. But some some kids were because mm -hmm. it, it's not just undernourishment. It, uh, these kids often uh, get exposed to uh, illness, and that, of course, attacks the body as well. So there's a, a number mm -hmm. of different causes, oh, right. right? So you've got kind of poverty, you've got nourishment, you've got infections. Um, sometimes there's neglect involved. So a lot of different factors. The easiest, me, easiest way for me to ask this question is why did you do this? Like what, why? Because it's, it's it, first of all, it's, it's really profound. Um, and it really reaches into a world that, other than visiting some of the third world countries I visited over the years, um, I don't really have a, I don't really have a, uh, um, and seeing people where I've been around in the U S that live in poverty and, and are undernourished, like 
Was there some greater thing driving you to say, as opposed to answering the research question, was there something you wanted to bring into the world that was important to you? Yeah. So we are, I mean, we're pursuing this sort of vision that um, assessing cognition in infancy can be a really important tool to trying to, to help kids, really. So the idea is, if, you know, this was a first attempt to say, is this type of thinking that we've been studying for a long time, does it detect in a very sensitive way differences between, between kids who are at different levels of risk, right? And if it does, mm -hmm. that gives us a, a new tool to start to like test out early interventions and things like that. Because now we can tell this kid's having trouble, you know, relative to this other child. And it gives us a tool to track if we're having an effective intervention, is that improving thinking systematically as we go. When you say intervention, what, what do you mean by intervention? Yeah, so we're, um, we're exploring a, a couple different ideas. Um, there's, um, some interventions that have been tried in the, in the U.S. looking at uh, caregiving methods. So trying to, it's a, um, it's a whole other area of, of research. Um, but um, uh -huh. so when infants and caregivers are playing together, um, right, naturally, sometimes, you know, as a, as a, as a parent, you might notice Hey, my kid's focusing in on the, the toy truck, right? They're looking at the mm -hmm. truck. They're pushing the, you know, they're rolling the wheels on the truck, whatever. And you might then follow them into that, what we call fo that focus of attention or that episode of attention, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that would be what we would call an infant led focus or attentional episode. Other times, you know, naturally as you're playing and you're interacting, Sometimes you direct your attention somewhere else and you pick up a, you know, the, the, the tikka and you hold it up and say, look, a tikka. And that then shifts their focus of attention to the tikka. All right. So that's then right. a parent mode attentional episode. Yes. Right? Yes. So it turns out that evidence suggests that having more infant led attentional episodes early in development tends to improve things like working memory. Got it. So there are some interventions looking at caregiving, trying to es essentially teach parents this part of your, in your interaction style matters and you're actually helping to shape your child's thinking by following them into their, their focus of attention. Yeah, I mean, the thing, that, the thing that certainly comes to my mind when you're talking about all this is that if a child is stunted um, at 18 months, it's like discernible, notable deficiencies. It seems like it's only going to contribute to the cycle that they, that they grew up in, yeah. which is exactly. poverty, undernourishment. If someone isn't that, if a person, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's like, how do you stop that? And it didn't dawn on me until you just said it, that that's a big piece of the puzzle. And, and yeah. You know, my mind immediately wants to go to how do you solve it? But, you know, th th that's one thing I just thought of. Yeah. Yeah. So we're thinking about kind of interventions targeted around caregiving. There's also potential for nutritional inter interventions. Right. So there's a lot of really smart people working on ways to try to uh, essentially, you know, figure out how can you break this, this physical cycle and give kids like nutritional supplements so that even though they're getting undernourished, you can still mm. help them grow physically in more you know, normative ways, essentially. And then that might, of course, have impacts on thinking and stuff like that. So. After doing this, do you feel hopeful? Do you feel overwhelmed? I'm not saying yeah. any one thing. I'm just like, when I read this, when I read the article, which, by the way, just so everybody knows, I sent John a voluminous list of very interesting questions on his Facebook post that he, he promptly deleted, deleted somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was, I was responding to each of your questions, right? 
And then I, I started right. to do a response to one of them. And each of the previous ones had said, Tim Taylor, and then response, right? right? And then I was typing one and it didn't say, I realized it didn't say Tim Ta- Taylor. And so I was like, oh, damn, I'm now just generically replying. So I deleted my, I tried to delete that reply and I ended up deleting your whole damn post. <laughs> and I was like, ah, what an easy moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thought that was really funny. Um, but, but like, how do you, because like people who are psychologists, therapists, like I just, there's no way your person can't be engaged. And I've, I watch some of these shows like couples therapy and I, and I just get behind it when I see the therapist doing their work with the, their guidance person, whatever they call them. But it's like, how would you describe your feelings before the research? And now that it's published, how would you describe your feelings after it? So, I mean, the, the whole project um, was, was quite an experience because I, you know, we, we, this was a, a study where we tracked kids for, um, we, we were running it for a couple of years. We, we tracked them for one year, but we had four mm-hmm. groups of kids because we had to do the data collection, of course, through time, and we had a large sample. So it was a project that, that took several years to finish. And I was, I would go in and kind of help with data collection, make sure things were, were mm-hmm. going well. So I, you know, visit NDM multiple times. And um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a really uh, profound experience for me to kind of go there and uh, get to know the my my colleagues, of course, but then also get to know the yep. kind of families and the community a bit better. Um, yeah, so it definitely affected me personally. It was actually we had a, a, a lovely opportunity where my my whole family came over toward the end of data collection. Uh, so Larissa and the kids got to see sort of the the, the you know the whole operation on the ground and visit Lucknow oh. and Shugar and meet some of the families as well. Wow. So that was really cool to have my kids there. Um, mm-hmm. And so definitely a, um, a, a body of research that, you know, touches me more personally than other things I do, just because it was such a, a, a unique experience for me. And I think, you know, we're hoping to continue this line of work um, so I'm definitely, I think we've got great data and even though we're, you know, it's hard because we're finding out that some kids aren't doing as well as others. That's a hopeful thing for me because I can say, okay, as a scientist, now I can dig my teeth in here and say, how can I help those kids? Right. Oh, got it. And so that's really motivating for me is to, you know, have tools we can now use to leverage, you know, lift and all these kids up. And do you feel a sense of urgency around that now that you've got data? Yeah. I mean, that, that's also another thing is, you know, I feel like, okay, we, we've got the data now let's get, let's get to it. But of course that's not the way science and politics work. So now I got to get new rounds of funding to do the next, the next step and the next step and the next step. And uh, that's a, Tiring time consuming process. No. Right. Wait, so are you leading this? John? What's that? Are you leading this? Uh, yeah. So this is, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, I could ask like a million more questions, but I want, and I want to be respectful for your time. And I, I think it's really cool that, that your whole family went there. Yeah, it's um, it great. It's a really interesting, it's, it's, the, it's the strangest take your daughter to work day story I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Indeed. It was, it was quite the, yeah. quite the experience. And then, you know, yeah, I would have, was they, that... had a, they had a, I think it was, if you, if you talk to them, they would say it was a very unique experience, I think. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know from Katya, whether that was part of why she decided to do what she yeah. did uh, in, at Sussex. So yeah, I, I would just have a hard time it would just be really challenging for me to be able to keep a scientific distance, a research distance when I see this heartbreaking dynamic play out. Um, and so. I think, I think the, 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 the cool thing is though, like 
you know, you're in this ob ob objectively moving context where these, with these people who don't have many resources, but I, you know, I remember sitting in this courtyard and meeting some of these families and just, we, we would have these amazing, wonderful interactions, even though the huge language barrier, of course, but you could just see right. kids are kids and they're out yes. there playing in the courtyard. They don't have, you know, fancy toys or whatever, but they're running around just like kids do everywhere around the world, oh. you know, and they're laughing yeah. and they're, they have these close relationships with their, with their family. And yeah. So even though it's difficult on, on one hand, it's also like very rewarding on the other hand, because you see the, the power of human development right there in front of you. Yep. Well, I appreciate you sharing about all that. I thought it was awesome. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what more comes of that. And uh, I think we're at, it's a great point to, you know, given that sort of global perspective, that, that connective perspective you just mentioned about uh, kids is a great point to pivot to the final piece of the pod where you're going to have five minutes to talk about, or less if you want, it's up to you, anything you want about the father-daughter relationship, or you can talk more about parental trends globally uh, in the in people who are whatever you want uh, and by the way another tip to watch this is john um is the most thoughtful looking guy because you've lost some of your hair that that lovely curly hair yeah. you had but you have grown a beard that <laughs> like that is one of those beards where i swear if you just start stroking it it's like oh my god john's thinking deeply <laughs> when in fact he could be like you could be like, you know, shoveling the Doritos out of your brain. <laughs> it still looks like you're thoughtful. It's like everything you say somehow has more gravitas ah, nice. because of the way That's you look. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and anyway, I'll just um, fell off. You right? have five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes to talk about whatever you want, John. Go for it. Yeah. Um, what do I – so, you know, thinking about – coming onto the, the podcast and you know, like look, let's look through all your questions. And one of the mm -hmm. big things, and I mentioned this already, but you know, I think the, the, the biggest interesting challenge when thinking about parenting a daughter or a son is just the nature of what we think of as dynamic parenting. And I'm not sure yeah, you could you could tell me in your conversations about about parenting with other people, but do you think, you know, like new parents in particular, I don't think have a, a, a deep appreciation for just how crazy dynamic parenting has to be, <clears throat> because every step mm -hmm. of the way you've got this developing child who is just always transforming before your eyes, and you know. We, Everyone thinks, oh, I got to, you know, do parenting right. And I've got to make sure I have the right skills. And I always want to say, there is no right way. You're going to be co-developing as a parent with this child in right. front of you. And you have to sort of embrace just the, the chaotic, changeable nature of that relationship over time. Um, and as a, a scientist, that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, and yeah, I'd be kind of curious to hear your your views on, do you think parents sort of resonate with that and appreciate that? Or does that just kind of come out of the blue for some people? Okay, um, that's a great question because, so I have a foundational belief and that is the world would be so much better if people worked on their own shit, just, it would be so much better. And uh, my belief is that uh, from a parenting perspective, that dynamic parenting you're talking about, my experience with Zoe was that as she stepped into more complex issues, I had to look at myself and say to myself, where am I triggered? Like, oh, she wants to talk about what does it mean to argue in a intimate relationship? And um, I have to say, what's my relationship with what arguing mm -hmm. is? 
because if I have an unhealthy one, it's going to imprint to a certain extent on her. And I have to be very self-reflective about what is real. Like, I don't want to give her another load, to, to uh, another burden right. to carry. And that's hard, John. Yeah. That's very difficult for a lot of people. And thank God the younger generation has a different view towards help. And I yeah. think that's really where, when you say, do they have the aptitude for it or the appetite for it? I think that the, one of the biggest barriers is you start getting to, a, you start having a young adult and you need to look at what kind of adult am I? Right. And, uh, and, and so my experience is that it's, it's hit or miss on whether parents, um, are willing to do that work. Yeah. yeah interesting. <clears throat> yeah. It's a great, great perspective on, um, cause you know, I, we have to think about parenting and that sort of dynamic back and forth. But of course, mm-hmm. each person is an individual as well. You have to, right. you know, what you bring to that back and forth depends on where you are as, as an individual and how far you are sort of on your journey as well. Well, I mean, it goes back to that, that book that, that the body keeps the scores right. because for me, it's so simple. And then there's also a chapter in Eckhart Tolle's book called the new earth, which is called the pain body, which is one of the best chapters I've ever read of a book that talks about this specific thing, because what I try and do when I'm with Zoe is pay attention to my body because mm-hmm. my body will tell me stuff well before my conscious mind right. will tell me stuff. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, um, I appreciate those. Is, is there any thoughts, any other thoughts you want to share about that dynamic parenting idea, John? No, no, I'm um, just, yeah, I'm <laughs> just rolling with it. So. Just, just rolling, rolling with it. it. Got it. Well, that's, that's, a, it's the perfect time in the podcast to roll with things. Um, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm so glad I reached out and asked you to come on because um, it's just great to hear how thoughtful and, and, you know, it's, it was like a good exchange. It's like, we're both like, having this exchange about things. And I particularly love the research that you're doing and what you're trying to do. So um, thank you so much for saying yes and yeah. um, staying up as late as 6.30. <laughs> <you. Nah. laughs> it just blows my mind that you have another five hours in your yeah. day. It's just, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Well, it was great, Anyways, great to be on. Seriously. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, good to have you on. <laughs>